Good morning and welcome to Global Perspectives. From our home studios, I'm David Dunkey. And I'm Katie Coronado, welcome. Today we are joined by a special guest, an award-winning writer and producer of a variety of television sitcoms, including the Netflix show Family Reunion, which is, which is currently running. We're honored to have Meg Deloche, welcome. Thank you, happy to be here. So let me start the questions by asking, how did you get started in Hollywood? Wow, um, more years ago than I'd like to admit, um, <laughs> but over 20, I um, went to school at American University and I knew I wanted to write in television. Um, and so I drove across country without really knowing a soul. Um, and I landed a job as a personal assistant to Keenan Ivory Wayans uh, in Living Color was the hot show then. Um, and that was sort of my entree in, um, meeting people, asking questions, learning what I needed to do, what kind of scripts I needed to write. Um, but it kind of just started with the attitude that, why can't I do it? Uh, somebody's doing it. Um, and having parents that, you know, who really thought I'd be home in a couple of months, but told me, of course you can do it. <laughs> um, I got the opportunity and I've never left. Meg, we uh, know that your show is one of the most watched comedies on Netflix currently. We also know that there is a lack of representation of the Black community, the Hispanic community uh, in Hollywood in general. Can you talk to us about that? You know, it, it's an unfortunate fact um, that there just isn't the diversity that I think that the world craves to watch. Um, and I think Netflix is really good at um, sort of trying to serve all parts of, all segments of its demographic, all the demographics that watch them and all segments of them. Um, I actually was, you know, um, I've had people reach out to me through social media um, and they're not the people that we are so-called targeting per se, but they love the show. And the whole point is any family comedy should be universal. Even if we're focusing in on a black family, it's it's not so much about the fact that they're black, but that, that the fact that they're a family and that they're going through all the things that your average American family is going through. And I think when you serve that up to a diverse audience, I think that people, one, they enjoy it, and they're entertained. And two, sometimes they get a window into uh, someone else's life and there's an, an understanding and a recognition of how much we have in common instead of focusing on the differences like so many people like to do. So Meg, I'm wondering, how, how did this show come, this particular show come about? Did Netflix approach you? Did you make a pitch to them? Um, in this case, Netflix approached me um, I sat down with an executive, Robert Prince, uh, who's a really smart guy, and he'd been studying um, their, their various audiences, and he felt like the Black audience would be really well served with a family show. Um, and the only thing he said to me is, like, I'd love to have a show about a Black family, and I want them to go to church. And I'm like, well, that's how I grew up, um, so I could do that in my sleep. Um, and so we, you know, sort of sat there for a couple of hours. Um, we'd known each other for a while and we sort of put it together. I, I, uh, borrowed heavily from the life of a close friend of mine who was married to a football player. Um, and you know, she was a very serious church girl when she met him and I sort of moved some of the elements around. Um, and you know, I wanted to also fold in the fact that I had gone home for a family reunion uh, in Columbus, Georgia, about a year and a half before, before um, I sat down for this pitch. And I just remember how good it felt to be there and to be surrounded by family, but at the same time, how I couldn't fathom living in such a small town because it's so different from the life I led. Um, and so we sort of married all those different elements and family reunion was born. That's excellent, Meg. And can you touch on some of the topics that you're able to write about uh, with your writers that we'll talk about in a second? What kind of topics are you able to bring to the communities, uh, to everyone who watches Netflix? Well, something that is very important to me is the recognition of black history. Um, it, so much was taken from us 
um, those of us who are African Americans. And, um, you know, like it's a really big deal to me. I have my great great grandmother's china. Um, though there are little things like that, most of us don't get things like that handed down um, in, in our families. And so it was important to me for the McKellen family that I create a history for them, that they know their history, that uh, the matriarch of the family, Madeer, tells the children when she realizes that they don't know the family history, she sits them down and walks them through, you know, the intricacies of how they came to be. Um, this season that we're working on now, I did a different history episode. Um, it's called um, When Madeer Changed History. And now I'm offering up very well-known historical events, and I'm adding the comedy of the fact that I have this uh, slightly magical uh, grandmother who has inserted herself into these events and helped to shape them. Um, and I think while people will be entertained, they'll laugh, um, and, and I think be moved by it, I think that there are going to be a lot of people who will walk away and go, oh, well, that's a little bit of an aspect of Black history I never really knew or was exposed to. You have a uh, very high profile lineup of actors. Can you tell us how, how that worked? Um, when I wrote the show, I wrote it with Loretta Devine's voice in my head, but I never thought she would actually read the script, let alone agree to do the show. Um, that I was such a long shot. And when they said, well, who do you want to go out to? I was started naming other actresses and they're like, well, what about Loretta? You know, and I'm like, Loretta, well, she's not going to do this. Um, so that was that was really a dream come true. Um, and then from there, to get Tia Mowry, who I I can't even remember. She's been on so many hit shows. Um, I think four or five. Um, her record's amazing. And to sit down with her and uh, and we just talked about how much the show resonated with her. She was raised by a very devout mother. Um, and, you know, to sort of start the cast from there, we got some really wonderful up and coming uh, new talent. And then to round it out with Richard Roundtree as grandpa, um, it was an amazing thing. And, and then for them to gel together the way they have, um, it, it's, it's been a really heartwarming experience. We were, you know, so, so sad at the end of our first season to leave each other. With COVID, we were just shell shocked, you know, and we would Zoom once a week until it was like, okay, we can Zoom once a month. But, um, you know, we're really quite attached to each other. So, Meg, you, you're mentioning the how the cast gelled and came together. Um, you also have a very unique writing team, which is which is an all all black team. How unique is that? And is this is this the first experience you've had with a team that's 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 entirely African American? Well, it's it's very unusual. Let me start by saying that. Um, I have had the experience of being in a very small all black writers room um, for a black network um, like BET, but never um, for a major network or streamer. And the fact that uh, Netflix not only welcomed it, they encouraged it was just phenomenal. I have had so many fights with studio and network executives over the uh, makeup of my writer's rooms over the years. Um, and invariably, I, I've been told stories anecdotally of how many times I've not been put in somebody's writer's room because they wanted some other writer, usually not a, never another writer who was a writer of color. Um, so it's a really big deal. It's been incredibly gratifying. The key thing for us is we wanted a diverse all black room. So, you know, I, I didn't want anybody who was raised just like I was. We have people from all over the country, from all different social and economic backgrounds, educational backgrounds, um, all different ages. It's just so important to us that we want to sort of weave together sort of this tapestry of an African-American family um, that so many different people will identify because we've got threads of maybe this person's family history or, you know, uh, chunks of this person's um, educational background and how they were raised. And, you know, so we sort of like kind of end up seamlessly putting it together. 
Um, but none of us are all the same. Meg, speaking of differences and similarities and the need for diversifying, your show is watched all over the world because it's dubbed in different languages, right? Well, it's dubbed into 24 different languages. Um, it, it's certainly, we are, we know that um, we seem to particularly resonate uh, in um, Latin America and Africa uh in great britain the, those are the countries that i i remember they they sort of pointed out in particular um i feel like if people discover us often we do quite well um comedy sometimes isn't something uh, for you know it can be very subjective and cultural um but i think that we have enough of the other parts of our culture that we're offering up that I think people find kind of intriguing. Um, so it's been really gratifying um, hearing from people. I've, I've got um, a Facebook friend from India um, who found the show. So it's just really cool to, you know, know that it doesn't matter sort of where you were raised and, um, you know, what dishes you eat at the holiday, at your holidays, that you can enjoy family reunion. Of course, you're 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 using uh, comedy as a way to communicate, but you're talking often about serious issues and, and at a very serious time and for our nation and and actually beyond our nation. But division is very much uh, in the news. Discussion of uh, racial dialogue is is has been higher in recent years than than before. Um, where does your show fit in in this context? You know, we really try to be honest and direct um, when we deal with issues like race. Um, I think that there there are ways that people can utilize the show to talk to their kids about things that aren't necessarily very easy to um, approach or to explain. Um, you know, for example, we did do an episode dealing with racial profiling um, and it's 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 something I have a seven almost seven year old little boy, um, and it's not something I've really wanted to talk about with him in depth. You kind of have to figure out at what age are your children going to be able to internalize this message and not find it harmful. Um, but I think that you know the way we did it on this particular um, episode, you know, we just showed that people can sometimes make assumptions about you simply by the way you look, but that the repercussions from that sometimes can be really frightening. Um, and I just think that if we could talk more frankly with each other about issues like this and about race, I mean, we did an episode where Jade has uh, an interest in a white boy and he reciprocates, but she lets other people get in her head about interracial relationships and she ends up turning this guy down for a date and bitterly regretting it. Um, and I just think it's important that people learn to make their own decisions about who they're going to love, um, also about you know who they're going to be friends with, and that the only way kids can do that is if you talk with them really frankly about it and, and sort of just present it to them and go, well, how would you like to deal with this issue? Meg, these are very delicate uh, topics for, and sometimes they're uncomfortable topics for people, some people to discuss, families to discuss. So to transition from that, going to the writer's room, how do these ideas uh, happen and how are they generated? Do they sometimes uh, clash with one another? Because you said your writers are from all over the country, different uh, ways of you know being, uh, uh, they were brought up differently. Talk to us about that. Uh, idea making factory? You know, conflicts like that in the writer's room can be so exciting. Um, generally, they get really outrageous, um, maybe a little vulgar, um, and, and often very funny. And so I think that Yes, often, it, depending on what the subject matter is, um, you can definitely have a lot of conflict. And, you know, I would never do that. I can't believe you would ever say that kind of a thing. Um, but then there are a lot of subjects, like when we dealt with racial profiling, you know, that episode came about because 
one morning I saw video of police officers um, arresting young black boys. Somebody had said they had seen some kids in the neighborhood with a gun. And this little boy in particular, um, who I think was about 11, was just sobbing un inconsolably. And the, doc and, the, and the cop was trying to be nice. You know, hey, buddy, you're going to be all right, buddy. Kneel in the middle of the street, buddy. Lay down, buddy. OK, buddy, let me see your hands. But you know, it doesn't matter. They're holding guns on him the whole time and he's crying. And of course they didn't have any guns and it just, it was traumatizing. And I came into the room and I shared the video and we talked about it. And of course, in an all black writer's room, we tend to have some things that we're going to definitely agree on. And this was not a controversial topic. Um, if anything, it, what became controversial sometimes is how early do you tell your children? How forcefully do you tell your children? Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, there we have a universality sometimes with um, being people of color. We're going to all have our own stories or stories of people we know and love who've been in this situation. So your, your, your show, Meg, has been obviously uh, quite popular. What has been the response from the audience and who is who's watching Family Reunion? Um, the audience is it's so wonderful. You know, it just makes you feel so good when you know you've connected with people. Um, I get a lot of comments about people um, watching it over and over. Um, a lot of people during COVID discovered the show and, and it was a feel good experience for them, which, um, I thought was really gratifying. Um, I think that I've got a pretty diverse audience again, based on, you know, the people who reach out to me or to the actors, um, and so forth during, uh, through social media. I think that, um, luckily for us, we seem to have sort of, um, connected with a lot of people. The show, I mean, the multi-camera format is a little old fashioned, um, but it's a, it's got a comfort to the familiarity of it. Um, and I think that a lot of people and in certain times seek this kind of comfort food entertainment. Uh, Meg, and this type of show where you have an all black family and you were actually uh, picked to do something like this, is that, uh, unique in Hollywood right now. Are you seeing more of this trend? Um, the more I try to find shows like this, they're sprinkled, you know, but but it but it's not as easy to find. Um, is that something that you find as well from the uh, producer perspective? It's still not, I think, where we want it to be. Um, I will say that there have been some promises made in the last few months um, in the midst of this awakening um, in, this, in this country. And some pledges have been made. And I think that it's going to be important to hold these large entertainment companies accountable to what they've promised to do, which is to provide more diverse programming and allowing more diverse voices to be heard. Um, I just think it's critical. It, you know, one of, the, I love watching and uh, consuming entertainment by Asian women, by East Indian women. I, I'm fascinated by the culture and and why wouldn't I be? And why would they be vice versa, you know, about um, black women or Latin women? I, I just think it would be so smart to tap into that and to continue to, um, you know, have a global audience. I think that the networks would want to do that. Netflix has seemed to figure it out. And with, I don't know, what, two or 300 million, you know, subscribers, it's working. When you're, when you're look, thinking about a global audience, I, I guess a couple thoughts. One is, how different is it for you as a writer and producer to approach a, a show uh, that you're thinking about is going to be a global audience as opposed to something that was almost strictly domestic. For example, you know, in Living Color, which was a very, very successful show, but it was a different era. Yeah, and a lot of their comedy was very um, specific to American pop culture. Um, and so you don't know, sometimes that can't export because people don't necessarily um, understand. 
Um, I think that our comedy is a little bit more universal because it's more family based, you know, it's not sp particularly adult. Um, and so I think it's probably easier for um, other cultures to get where we're coming from. Um, I don't focus over much on a global audience. I, I try to stay very specific to my family and to the culture I'm trying to present. Um, but it is still important to me, you know, in presenting different facets of uh, American, African American life. Um, I try to bring in, um, you know, global African uh, or, or um, global black people, you know, whether it's a, a black girl who was raised in Britain um, or one that's from Nigeria, et cetera. I'm really seeking to sort of like open up globally that way. Um, but not to change the show in any way toward it. I just think that what it is, people will appreciate it um, because it's so specific to this one family and culture. Meg, speaking of uh, specific things that bring in the audience based on the plot that you already have, how do you think that families or, or audience members that are potential uh, subscribers to Family Reunion would be attracted to the show? Uh, and it, it, Basically, my question is, do you think that there's something that appeals to everybody other than the family portion? What do you think that appeals to everybody from the show? I think part of the magic is in Madeir. I've referred to this wonderful grandmother character as almost a superhero. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, she's the, you know, the grandmother everybody wants to have. Um, while she is very strict and very disciplined, she's incredibly loving, she's quick to feed you, um, and she's going to be your biggest fan uh, out in the world if you need that kind of support. Um, I, I think that that is universal. I think that um, Coco's relationship to Madeir living in your mother-in-law's house is pretty universal. All of us can get how that's not an easy thing. Um, uh, the fact that Mose is a mama's boy. Um, again, these are just, you know, they're, they may be family relationships, but there's some really universal concepts that are kind of buried within it. Even just the sibling dynamics. Um, these are nice kids, but they're not always nice to each other, um, which is most kids, right? Yes, and what do, would you like to leave our audience with? You know, I guess I, I say that um, I would love for people to check out my show, to know that um, I really feel like it has something to say and, and would likely speak to them. Um, it's, it's not just a Black show. I'm not just a Black writer. Um, I've written many kinds of characters in shows and, and hope to continue to do so. Um, but there is a little something um, extra in this one because I'm talking so much about a world in which I live and have always lived in. So, so what can we expect uh, in the future seasons of, of Family Reunion? We, we have some real fun coming up. Um, I'm, I'm super excited. Um, we, right before uh, we had to break for COVID, Anika Nani Rose guest starred um, as Mozzie's music teacher um, with whom he has a, a serious crush on. Um, we've got some serious episodes. We are not gonna shy away from the social justice um, aspect of things that are going on in the black community right now. Um, and then we have some some very lighthearted, more warm family fun stuff. I think it's going to be another um, really interesting year. I really do. Once we make it to air, we're hoping um, that'll be in March if we can stay on schedule. So is laughter the best way to provoke uh, discussion? I think so. I think it's a great way. Um, I think when you laugh, you let your guard down, maybe open your heart a little bit, um, especially if you can, in the laughing, maybe recognize a little bit of maybe where you were wrong or misunderstood something um, or, you know, just weren't open to something. I think it's a really great way. Um, I, if I can add really quickly, I got, you know, I saw a blogger um, 
who complained bitterly about Family Reunion. She loved the show up until episode 10 when we did do the racial profiling um, episode. And she just felt like um, we politicized a show that was so, in every other way, so wonderful to her. And I thought, I think I did something right. I think I made you love some characters and then it really upset you that they were being mistreated and, and labeled a, a certain way. Um, and if, if that's the case, I, I hope that's the case. Um, you know, I, I want you to love my show and I want you to recognize that sometimes the lives that uh, we live as people of color are different from those other people in this country. Meg Deloche, thank you so much for joining us today and best of luck to you and Family Reunion as we go forward. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week on another episode of Global Perspectives. Mm -hmm.